Lance's was, son. Was, was Lance driving at that time? Tell yeah. us a little about Lance. Mm -hmm. well, what kind of a guy was he and how was it to race with well, him? Well, Lance was kind of the guy that would run hot and cold. Sometimes he'd be a real friendly and agreeable with everything and other times he'd kind of fly off the handle. And I would say he was an average driver. He wasn't all that competent, but he wanted to drive real badly and he was footing the bills, so he drove on. And Chuck Day was the other driver. He was fairly good too and an excellent mechanic. But like I say, the cars were just uncompetitive at that time. Most of the European cars were going to rear engines or mid engines and we didn't have a chance with this front engine car that we built. So we loaded up and came back home. And then uh, Lance decided he wanted to build another sports car, so we moved over into the building that uh, Shelby American barely eventually took over in Venice. And uh, we built a couple of rear engine, uh, like Formula One car replicas, and then a real one that we had a small block holes in was going to be real quick and it, it got to be such a displacement we couldn't keep the thing together. In fact, we started out with uh, 40 millimeter Webers on it. They wanted to make a four carburetor deal, so I came up with this interlaced manifold with four 48 or 40 millimeter Webers and they said, well, let's go bigger. So I made one with 48s and then finally we made, I made him one with 58 millimeter Weber's, those are like two and three eighths bores. So you can imagine four of those on a 140 inch Oldsmobile. They didn't work that well either. So. Anyway, they took all that mess to Australia and sold the engine over there and brought the cars back. And then uh, he decided he wanted to build another sports car. So Emil and I built him a little two man sports car. And uh, I think he raced it a couple of times. Now AJ Foyt has it with a Chevy in it, but at that time uh, the tax people decided he'd been playing long enough so they shut him down tax-wise and uh, Carol Shelby took over the building and that's how the Cobras got started. Let me interrupt you before we get to that part because that's really the GTs and the Le Mans stuff. Yeah. Let me interrupt you there just for a minute. Stu, could you tell us about your first trip to Indianapolis, the type of welcome you got People were skeptical, I would think, of your new product and you were trying to develop. Uh, before I go into that, um, let me tell you something that happened a little earlier. Before okay. the end Great. Of it. Uh, it was when I built the first fuel injector. Uh, it was a long, tedious job because not only didn't have any money, we didn't have much in the way of tools. But uh, after struggling, we finally got the first unit put together, and we needed some way to test it. Uh, no dynamometers around in those days. So what we did is went up to uh, one of the little dry lakes up there that doesn't get used very often. Just uh, our own group that was not a race meet. We didn't even know if the unit would fire up or not. Fortunately, uh, it did fire up, and I put it around, put it around, uh, stopped a couple of times, checked the condition inside the engine for trouble, didn't seem to have any, so then we decided to have a, a faster run. So I upped the speed, went down the lake bed, I guess before I go any farther than this, uh, we had no ambulances there, we were all by ourselves, so we had to be careful how fast we went. Anyway, I picked up the speed and got running pretty good, decided to come in again for another test just to be safe. Everything looked good for another hard run this time. Uh, I got down probably oh maybe a mile and um, trouble hit. I don't know what happened but uh, the car quit. Uh, nothing to do but take it back and fix it. Well when the fellows came down to pick me up they circled back 
And as they started to turn the corner, we came upon a, a deep pit. It was probably um, 10 feet wide, maybe six feet deep. And my engine had stopped just short of that pit. If it hadn't, I wouldn't be here today. Well, yeah. well that, was, that was the injector on the flathead? Yes. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. The Speedway was a different problem. Uh, uh, by the time we got running good, uh, still no dynamometers, of course. Uh, no way to test it. Uh, not even any way to guess how much fuel the engine was going to run. Uh, the only advantage I had there was uh, I was working in those days as a chemist, and I knew quite a bit about fuels. And I think I tried every fuel in the world to see if it was any better than what we had. Uh, of course, in Indianapolis, you had to run the methanol. Uh, I think I made the first run when a pure guess as to what size we had to run to get the fuel flow that we wanted. I ran, my, I ran the first test on our own car with a good guess, and I think probably uh, right away we got a lot of interest because we had a pretty darn good time. Uh, the next thing that surprised me was when my own crew people were preparing for the uh, detailed work they do to prepare for the race. They took the injector off and put on the carburetors. Well, that was a disappointment, but uh, the reason they said was we don't know if it'll ever run. 500 miles. Well, I had to admit they were right. So I swallowed my pride and went ahead about getting it ready for the race. In the meantime, uh, I was approached by uh, two or three different uh, other racing teams. They wanted to try the fuel injector because we had such a good time. So I think uh, uh, Everett, I believe the fellow's name, was the first one that wanted to try it. So we took it over, put it on his car, and he fired it up. Well, he didn't last very long. It wasn't that anything went wrong with the injector. He pulled it in just after we went halfway around and told the owner of the car, I can't drive the car this way. It has so much horsepower I'm way over rev. <laughs> well, that was good news. <laughs> so the next thing to do was to change the, the uh, injector by going to a, a different uh, size so we could make the car run faster with less revs. Well, the basic thing there is just to make a jet change. Okay, he changes the jet, goes out. This time he gets three quarters of the way around comes back in, and the uh, car owner says, well, what's the matter this time? He says, it still goes too far over RPM. It runs good, but I can't run to full speed. So the next thing then was to make a radical change. Well, the car owner was getting nervous by this time, and he didn't want to do it, but the driver said, it's either changed it so it doesn't over rev or don't run it at all. You'll blow the engine. Well, that kind of got to him. So this time we made a, a radical change and he was out, 
he gets all the way around this time. And he kept upping the speed and upping the speed and we were okay. And finally he got to the point where he said, uh, I think it's all set. Uh, how was our speed? They said, it's the fastest speed you've ever run. So we said, okay, put her in line and we'll go to qualify her. And he did that, and he did get the fastest speed of the day and got the thousand dollar prize in Indianapolis for being the fastest qualifier. Do you remember the driver's name, Stu, by any chance? Uh, Everett, uh, uh, <laughs> let me think. My bad memory's back. <laughs> Who was the owner? Do you remember the owner? I have everything here, so while you're doing something else, I'll look up his name. Okay. <laughs>